What's up, everyone? Oh, we're live already, huh? Glad that's over with. Um, so, okay, Wayne's here. David should be coming. Was that him that just left, period? Who was that? That was some mystery guy. It's like, uh, his name is Dot. Reuven, do you mind if we go off live for a few minutes to wait for David? And I wanted to do some stuff off live anyway. If that's possible. Oh, never mind. I guess it's not. Um, well, just unless we can edit the video afterward before it goes up on YouTube, because I don't know how long we're going to be waiting. Someone said that they're going to be late, but I thought it was Wayne. Yeah, it's live streaming and recording to YouTube. I mean, you could go into it later and edit it, but for a while it'll be like this. Unedited, yeah. Okay. If you guys want to start a new hangout, I'll join it. Is everyone else here? Wayne, are you here, Wayman? I mean, as in not AFK? Okay. Maybe that's him. Yeah, that's him. All right, yeah, no sense in starting over for a few minutes then. Sorry, I'm just um, getting the link to David, and then we'll start. And he said his mic's broke, but he'll get a, another mic uh, by next week. So I'll probably just read out, or someone can read out anything you notice he says in the side chat. And then Wayne, did you say you had a mic? I forgot. Okay, cool.
Oh, there's David. Okay, everyone ready? Want to get this hangout started? Okay, um, so basically we don't have a name for this group yet, at least not an official one, but our hope is to do higher critical reading and discussion of different books ranging from commentaries on the Old Testament to um, New Testament stuff, even uh, maybe reading stuff that's not necessarily even directly related to the Bible, like um, Babylonian mythology, um, maybe early Gnostic writing, stuff like that. Um, and the first book we picked was a book, actually I think it's a, uh, a section from a larger book called Genesis by uh, Hermann Gunkel, um, who, as far as I'm aware, basically developed form criticism, um, which is basically you examine... The purpose is to examine the genres of, um, in this case, stories within the book of Genesis to figure out, you know, um, what purpose do they serve to the reader or to the culture of the time. Um, and we read chapters one and two. Oh, by the way, the, this excerpt from the larger book Genesis that we're reading is called Legends of Genesis. And um, we read chapters 1 and 2 to start. And basically, if you guys don't mind, I'll just go through some of the notes I took, and then we can just discuss. I mean, I don't have any particular... Uh... <laughs> yeah, I'll read the whole thing right now, John. I don't have any particular framework as far as discussion. I was just figuring we could... I would hit some of the highlights. Is everyone cool with that? And then we can just take it from there. Okay, so um, I'll just read some of my notes. Uh, the first section or chapter is called The Significance and Scope of the Legends. And um, he distinguishes between legend and history, and he says that legend is basically something that originally was an oral tradition and a very primitive oral tradition typically, whereas history was something that's originally was written. Um, and he mentions some, just as a side note, kind of, he mentions some anachronisms in some of the phrases used throughout Genesis, like uh, even to this day, or in those days the Canaanites dwelt in the land, which, uh, and this is where he's addressing the traditional um, view that Moses authored um, the Pentateuch, including Genesis. But the phrases like this are curious if they're being written by Moses um, because they would be anachronistic um, because it seems like they're referring back to a, a way back time so in other words it seems like more likely they're being written by someone way after the time of Moses um, and he, he tells us he argues that history deals with important public events, like grand, kind of grander scale events, whereas legend uh, seems much more concerned with personal and mundane details of people's lives, their personality, um, just m much more little things that you wouldn't expect to find in a, a broader scope history where we'd be dealing with politics and you know, you know, stuff like that. And uh, he says that history depends, in some sense, must depend on eyewitness accounts or testimony, either, either not directly, but there is some older account of an eyewitness of some event, and this is being based on it. Or sometimes the author themselves of the history would be an eyewitness to the events he's describing. 
Um, by contrast, legend um, seems largely to rely on imagination, where there's where there wouldn't have been anyone present to witness the events. For example, the the creation story in Genesis one, and a few other things in Genesis. Um, and he says that, uh, so, like again, some of the reported stories, mainly the creation, uh, must have come from a time predating even the uh, nation of Israel. So he argues that, in particular, that story would have come from a time, like he says, that if you take the literal assumption of Genesis, that you know, six thousand years ago, um, all this stuff happened, or roughly six thousand years ago, all this stuff happened. And it had just been passed on until the time of writing, whereas you know, and and this is written at the turn of um, the 20th century, and even by that time, you know, it was common knowledge that um, the development of the races, um, you know, evolution had been had been described for you know, what 50 or 60 years already, and that the time span between something like the origin of the universe and the Israelites as a people was a much greater chasm of time than what you would get just reading the uh, descriptions in Genesis. And um, so, that, so that the stories they're relating must have, in reality, predated um, any conception of there even being an Israelite nation, or in reality, even human beings. Um, and that's pretty much a lot of what he talks about in chapter one. I'm just I have actually printouts of it and I'm trying to go through some of these. Um, he also talks about something interesting. He calls it the criterion of incredibility, where events are described which seem to go against what we observe for how the world behaves today. Um, so I'll just read a quick section here. He says, Ancient Israel considered many things to be possible, which to us seem impossible. Thus, many things are reported in Genesis which go directly against our better knowledge. We know that there are too many species of animals for all to have been assembled in any ark, that Ararat is not the highest mountain on earth, that the firmament of heaven, of which Genesis um, chapter 1, verse 6 and following speaks, is not a reality, but an optical illusion. Uh, that the stars cannot have come into existence after planets and so forth. He goes through a bunch of examples. Um, and then, let's see. Yeah, the very early narratives in Genesis have a particular character where God seems to be directly involved in the world. For he's walk, he walks in the garden um, with Adam and Eve. Um, with his own hands, he he fashions man. He closes the door to the ark with his own hands. You know, he breathes his breath into man's nostrils, um, and makes unsuccessful experiments with animals. Which I'm not sure what what verses he's referring to there. Maybe Reuben or one of you guys knows. Um, he literally smells the sacrifices of Noah. Um, he appears to Abraham and Lot in the guise of a wayfarer, um, or as an angel, calls directly out of heaven. So basically, God's directly and immediately present in these really old stories. Whereas in the later books, we find that he's very seldom directly involved. Usually, it's through some sort of intermediary, like an angel or um, you know, just people are hearing a vo like in the prophets, people are hearing voices like in a fit or some ecstatic state. Uh, what was the name of that book? Uh, it's it's an apocryphal book in the Bible. It's it's not quite coming to me, but it's it it basically. Uh, I think it's the book of Tobit really that sort of does something like that. Well, when which when which an angel sort of instructs him. On the way to get rid of this sort of sex demon by tie, but by leading to Egypt and tying him to some kind of rock, um, and and engaging in marriage. I don't remember. I think it's the Book of Tobit, though. I could be wrong on that. Yeah, yeah, you're correct. It's it is Tobit. 
Yeah, so Toby would probably be a primary example of the later of the later pieces of literature that came out with regards to Judaism and how God is more people with an interest intercessory, such as either uh, you know, if he does engage people directly, it's usually through visions. Yeah. And even even the canonical stuff, I mean, we see a, a definite change between what some of the stories the early stories in Genesis and, you know, most of the later books. Um, God gets gets um, progressively less directly involved in human affairs. Um, yes, and then because just, scared of, uh, do you think that's because God is scared of the shit of us or something like that? Is that why he left us? Is that why we can't find him because he's scared of us? Well, I think I think Gunkel's basically arguing that as people kind of developed a more um, sophisticated theology. God became more abstract, and so um, whereas in these earlier myths he's like walking among men and all that stuff, later on God's become a more uh, abstract concept, and it doesn't seem proper for God to be, you know, having a physical body or directly doing things immediately in the world and stuff like that. Um, and then just to keep going. Um, there's an int a sentence I like. This is toward the end of chapter one. He says, uh, "Neither can we reject all other cosmogonies as fiction and defend that of Genesis as history. On the contrary, the account of Genesis chapter one, greatly as it differs in its religious spirit from other cosmogonies, is by its literary method closely related to them." Um, and then the final section, legend is poetry. Um, he basically emphasizes that viewing these legends as poetry shouldn't be shouldn't take away from them. He says that um, only ignorance can regard such a conclusion as irreverent, for it is the judgment of reverence and love. These poetic narratives are the most beautiful possession which a people brings down through the course of its history and the legends of Israel, especially those of Genesis, and perhaps the most beautiful and most profound ever known on earth. So, anyway, that's pretty much a summary of chapter one. Um, what do the rest of you guys think about it? If, if we want to just stick with chapter one, or we can jump and open up well, chapter two. Well, too. well getting back to Tobit, I, I think that um, 720 B.C., during the uh, Assyrian uh, takeover, uh, that's when... You know, roughly, they believe that text came out. So, so that's rather late. That's that's like right around the time of Hezekiah, right? And then, and then you got all the visions and very closeness of of the text between Isaiah and his visions and Jeremiah and his ideas, and especially Ezekiel, where he's pulled by his hair up into the heavens. So, I'm not sure how far away the thought process from the intimacy, uh, I would think that before the prophets, like, God was more in, intimate, obviously, where he's walking and talking and, and interacting with people and going to see how bad Sodom actually was, you know, meeting with Abraham during that whole thing. But after a while, it seems, as we're saying, he's intimate then between... Uh, Moses and Aaron, and it seems to be moving from like the whole nation and the whole of the people to the prophets and the leaders, and then kind of maybe fizzling out to where I don't know. I don't know where it would go. You know, it's I guess I guess. Uh, it wasn't as a nation anymore once it hit the prophetic age, I guess, and the leadership age. Yeah. Because it seems that once they decided who was the leader, he only dealt with the leader. Like, only dealt with Joshua, Gideon, uh, the kings with and the priests together. And then finally, you know, we, we have the priestly cast talking about the monarchs and the monarchs dealing with the priestly, and then God dealing with even the kings through prophets. Mm -hmm. So, uh, especially um, when Naaman's garden is taken over, prophet goes in to, 
to tell the bad news to the king. So, yeah, it's it's interesting. When did God ever deal with nations as a whole, though? He's always mm -hmm. dealt. He's always dealt with individuals. Uh, Sinai, right? When he, when all the people heard, they didn't hear anything. <laughs> they heard thunder. Supposedly, they allowed the uh, elders to go up part way up the mountain, but they didn't quite make it all the way. So at at the covenant, they they all had to agree, uh, so to speak, with the covenant of. Of Yahweh from the mountain. Yeah, I mean, it was, in a sense, a contract between him and the people of Israel. So, you know, I, I, that may be considered, do you guys consider that more immediate than, say, a prophet giving a, a prophecy to a king? Or is it really kind of not much of a difference as far as the immediacy of his? Presence in the world. Uh, what are you asking in terms of? Are you asking in terms of historical references, or are you asking in terms of theology? In terms of theology, I mean, what's? It, is there a big difference between the immediacy of God's action in the world between, say, the covenant, the covenant from Sinai with the Israelites, versus a prophet who had a vision of God and telling a king? Well, I'm just going to go to the relativistic rather than say that I'm not too sure which one sounds better at the mm -hmm. Because, you know, I, again, I'm an atheist, so I don't really have too much of a leaning either way, which one or the other. But uh, historically, um, I'd say, like, the time in which it came about was probably during, during, around, or sometime after Ezra came out. Um, that's where in which I personally believe that the whole immediacy of God being there versus God then becoming more, the, the time in which God became more distant and began communicating through visions or through angels or uh, setting up contracts here and there, we would uh, uh, force, enforce them via, via natural causes, so these kinds of things. I believe that's sort of in, either in and around or after Ezra came about. But that's that's my particular view. Yeah. One other thing that I really found interesting was... Uh, um, let me see if I'm on the right one here. Yeah. he, In contrast to some of the stuff he's describing from Genesis, where things happen that aren't familiar to our everyday lives, you know, miraculous, fantastic things... Um, he, he says this, Consider especially the central portion of the second book of Samuel, the history of the rebellion of Absalom, the most exquisite piece of early historical writing in Israel. The world that is there portrayed is the world that we know. In this world, iron does not float and serpents do not speak. No god or angel appears like a person among other persons, but everything happens as we are used to seeing things happen. In a word, the distinction between legend and history is not injected into the Old Testament, but is found to be, I'm sorry, but is found to be by any attentive reader already present in the Old Testament. Um, yeah, so basically he's just, even within the Old Testament, he's making the clear distinction between what seems to be legend or myth versus what seems to be legitimate history. Yeah, that does tend to be my understanding as well of Second Samuel, uh, being the fact that it is primarily an historical writing, so it doesn't really deal with very much of the you know, supernatural mm -hmm. uh, happenings or miracle stories. But he does recall fantastic stories of prophets during uh, during and around the time that were there and what they necessarily did. But this is more or less relation to the subject for which he's telling about the kingdom and the kings specifically, and uh, how they're how they're sort of uh, engaging in this war between uh, uh, between different parts of his between uh, I think it was uh, damn I can't I can't remember the the name of the other kingdom uh, which with Israel was actually going on it was it was the area that was represented as Palestine 
and then was uh, and then was taken over by Israel uh, before then. It, it's I can't remember the name. Um, David was saying that he does think the um, difference between um, this, the covenant from Sinai as opposed to uh, prophets having visions and talking to kings he sees as more immediate because quote, God is directly legislating instead of inspiring um, legislation. Yeah, I would agree with that distinction. Yeah, I, I think the whole idea, and, and this is what's hard using a text from 1909, and yeah. and after after like all the updated thinking about it since then, it's kind of hard. And it, but it, it's still interesting on the side to see how they back then segregated things out between myth and legend. Mm -hmm. Like if you look across the globe, like it was a part of storytelling to mix all that together, and. Uh, if you read anything, like the Iliad, the Odyssey, yeah, there, there might have been some excellent people, excellent warriors. There may have been a city of Troy someplace in the, in the distant past where all these events happen, but mixed in with legends and also reading what's not there, all the moral lessons about what is left unsaid between the lines that created this huge moral code on what you were supposed to do and not do and how maybe you offended the deities or not offended deities or in all that. Even, I think I already mentioned, you know, Herodotus, some, some of the things in his recapture of history and retelling are, is just totally outlandish. Whereas, you know, like later we find out, you know, maybe these things did or did not exist in, in the way that it happened, but also... I think a lot of that was there to jog the memory. And if you had important heroes, you need to tell why they were important and why they were exceptional in certain ways. And it's also put in there to uh, create nationalism. And, and that's a big part of it. Uh, a myth isn't a myth just to be a myth. It has to speak to people on a large scale. And if you're bringing in a whole bunch of people into your group to be cohesive, uh, you need those to relate to everybody. And I think that's kind of what um, the, uh, the uh, Hebrew literature uh, was doing. Yeah, um, I think that later scholars seem to... I mean, I think that some of these stories, rather than just having a merely ideological origin, had a rhetorical purpose, like you're saying. Um, and to the extent that they're maybe more rhetorically oriented versus ideologically oriented, it's kind of hard to say. But it seems clear that a lot of this stuff also had um, a, a focus on what the what the story was intended to relay to um, the reader, you know, rather than just explaining the origin of this ceremony or this tribe or whatever, you know. Yeah, I think... Uh, can I... I wanted to comment on... Uh, I right. You made a comment about Herodotus I want to go and correct. Is that Herodotus' purpose of actually uh, sort of detailing all these things about St. Lawrence's and whatnot, it was literally an attempt to say that we need to be able to interview and check our sources when we write history. And he utilized, uh, utilized the subject of dragons, of uh, 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 various sea monsters and sea creatures, various heroes, quote unquote. And he and he took the claims, he took the interview claims, and then and then he went through the library to see if they if any of them match up with what is known about history. This is this is sort of the earliest um, attempt to create history as a secular as a secular study. Before then, it was mostly religious. Before then, it was mostly devotion mixed with um, elements of secular methods, but nothing necessarily quite like secular methods. This is why Herodotus is the father of history. Mm -hmm. I just I just thought I'd point out that misunderstanding because a lot of people a lot of people when they read Herodotus they say, "Oh wow, this is all bullshit." 
when many people don't many people don't take the time to look at why he was actually doing what he was doing. Yeah. Yeah, but you know, there are there are some people out there who would say the same thing about Genesis and, and you're right there, uh what you just said about that. You know, like we need to we need to stop and take the time to see what they're doing and why they're doing it. And even um I think in uh Gunkel here uh mentions et etymology and word usage. Uh, I think in book two there, that's important, especially in Hebrew with the word play and all that. That that is extremely important, important in you know, especially the the early uh, primeval history of Genesis and things, uh, at least up to Genesis eleven, and sometimes even past that. There are tons of commentaries on word usage and what's happening. Mm -hmm. um, I'm jumping way ahead to the last paragraph of. Chapter two, but I think it's relevant to our current line of discussion. It's something you had mentioned, Wayman, about the exclusivity of the purpose of the stories. And he says, um, talking about all of what we've read so far up to the end of chapter two, the preceding classification of legends is based, of course, upon the chief or dominant features. Along with these go the purely ornamental or aesthetic features twining about the others like vines over their trellises. The art of these legends is revealed especially in this portrayal of the subject matter given. So that, um, I, I guess he's opening the door to um, that, the, that the, these stories could have had um, multiple purposes, although the ultimate origin, he, I guess he's arguing, is that was for a particular purpose. But that you could have history woven in, um, or different forms of legend woven into other forms and uh, stuff like that. So yeah, that it, it could even be, uh, if you don't mind me jumping in, I, I love talking, sorry about that. No, go ahead, I don't want to hug the mic. But think about this, if, if the, uh, like he's saying it, that it's, it's mentioning the high points, but it's also mentioning how things are done. So say Hebrew, oh, we're going to go to war. Well, well, how do we do that? How is it supposed to be done? So you get a long list of all the things that it would take, all the rituals that you go through, and all the processes that you would go through to do this war, or maybe one war. So, so that way, it's remembered, and they say, yes, that's how it was done. So not only buried in that story, there's also a, a war ritual or a holy war ritual buried into that, mm -hmm. and maybe even a poem about a prayer or something that somebody said. For example, like the Song of Deborah. Um, yeah, it's it's all like he's saying woven in, and, and it's really amazing. What do you guys think about his I claim to, that? Uh, oh, I sorry. To, it's quite right. I wanted to comment on something with regards to uh, what he said in terms of origin. Um, I would say that while that's the case, it depends on what we have here. Uh, in terms of Genesis, what the origin issue of it was primarily, I think we're so far removed to it on a point I think we have so little to go by. Even, even at this point in time, even though we have much that we've learned in the past 50 years alone, uh, what with the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, there's still a lot we're unsure about. So, in, so you know, for me, I would agree that we can find that out. But I don't agree necessarily that we can always find it out. We can only find it out if it's if it's so far if it's at a point that's so far removed from the original from the original element. I mean, most people estimate that the myths that were gathered around by Ezra and compiled into what is called the Five Books of Moses would uh, be from around 400 to 600, sometimes even around a thousand years before Ezra came, even more so than that, such as the epic of Gilgamesh. So, what the original purpose of this was, uh, what all these various intricacies were, the origin of them, I don't think we can find out. But we can find out what this meant in Ezra's time, uh, in, in various different groups. But that's all we can find out. So, you know, that's, that's what I sort of take issue with. Yeah, I mean, all this stuff is ultimately guesswork. Um, I think Gunkel's main approach is he doesn't 
he he makes passing mention to it, but basically what do these stories look like also in comparison to quote unquote myths of other from other traditions, not just um, Israelite tradition. Do they look like other myths? In, in other words, do they seem to have a similar purpose? Um, they don't look like history, because we have tons of examples of history, and the particular characteristics of these stories look more like myths from other traditions, like Babylonian myths, etc., rather than being historical writings. Yeah, I was going to say Babylonian, uh, more like uh, the religions of Babylonia are more like the Mesopotamian myths, uh, the ones around the, uh, what was it, the, the, the Ugaritic, uh, the one, mm -hmm. ones, uh, yeah, I, I believe there were a couple of Persian myths, like uh, like uh, the whole uh, Mithra effort that happened in those myths, especially with, interestingly enough, there were some borrowings of attributes from Anahita in the Old Testament, it's kind of weird. But but yeah, those those would be the area of myths. In fact, the closest in fact, uh, if you want an interesting related one, the east some of the eastern myths uh, also play a bit of a role of influence in, in some cases. Not all of them, not too many, but very some. Yeah, well, well, I think it's important to like notice like all the similarities. It's also important to notice the differences too. A lot of these epics mm -hmm. um, were handed to nations. You know, like uh, especially uh, well, much later the uh, Aeneid and Virgil and Homer's writings about the Greeks. You know, there's some that they could be proud of, and it built nationalism. But here in in, in Judaism and the Hebrews, it, it's a packet of nationalism. It's like stories of your patriarchs beginning of how possibly the first Hebrew was created with with Adam out of the dirt. Word plays there all the way up to the, the forefathers and the patriarchs and, and inside of that is, is, is like a packet of law codes on what you're supposed to do and how a nation is to like progress and all that is in like five books you know it's it's pretty interesting and there isn't nothing like that like that's the difference while, while there are law codes there's nothing with with the uh, with the with with the founders and patriarchs packed in with that, this would be like the epic of Gilgamesh ahead of, say, Law Code of Hammurabi, Hammurabi packed in with it. You know, this is a whole epic that was developed over, you know, long periods of time. Granted, it was probably put together much later than we like to think theologically. You know what I mean? But but still, it's it's a it's a neat little packet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead, Devin. Well, if you look at the um, if you look at the way in which it's portrayed, especially with the later books that were added in later, as well as what was going on, it's it's fairly clear that uh, that the history of, of of Israel in in many ways kind of parallels well, like the way in which they're trying to put this forth parallels like the creation of the Roman state with Romulus in in a lot of ways. Not exactly in in, in many ways, but the thematic themes. You know the rise of a particular leader, the first Roman, uh, who who is like who is like descended from the d divine origin. All these sort of various themes from from like the first council specifically. All these all these various myths to kind of do parallel that element there. But you're right, and the reason why there's so many of these people, and the reasons why they're so fluid, I believe, has more to do with the with the fact that they were hodgepodge together from various myths around the Middle East. I mean, like the Code of Hammurabi is probably uh, probably a primary example that I'm referring to in terms of the adaptations of codes. And I mean, some of the laws within uh, that are stated are actually repeats of things that are found in the Code of Hammurabi, but they are stated quite a bit differently. Those deviations from it. So, and, and it's estimated about sixty to around seventy-five percent, somewhere around there, uh, was like. Taken or derived from, in some form or another, from the Code of Hammurabi, and there are other codes too that they derived it from. I, I don't remember the, the rest of them. I think there were a few Egyptian ones that made that made their way into it. Uh, not necessarily from the Book of the Dead, but more or less, uh, more or less, uh, commandments of gods, which are more or less spells 
turned into commandments and laws. Uh, I can't remember the specifics. I, I think you might be able to look it up, but um, you know that, that's why I tend to see it as why that why it's so different because you have it's a mishmash book. The first five books are taken from so many different cultures and an attempt to sort of cultivate their own viewpoint, saying that this is the origin of everyone, which is kind of which kind of explains things because Israel back in the day used to be a lot like Rome. They used to expand their borders a lot. They used to expand their kingdoms a lot. So, yeah, and they, and they tried to and they tried to make as many people uh, who weren't originally Israelis uh, as as Israel. You know, they would conquer their city, they would take them, they would marry off their, uh, they would marry their own women in, into Jewish uh, Jewish patriarchal families. These kinds of things. This is exactly what Rome. This is exactly what uh, Alexander did in in many ways, and what Rome continued to do after that. What do you guys think about his um, Gunkel's tool of distinguishing history from legend? He says that um, history treats great, great public occurrences, while legend deals with things um, that interest the common people with personal and private matters, and is fond of presenting even political affairs and personages so that they will attract popular attention. And he gives, he goes into. Um, Later on he says, we hear a quantity of details which certainly have, for the greater part, no value for political history, whether they are attested or not, that Abraham was pious and magnanimous, and that he once put away his concubine to please his wife, that Jacob deceived his brother, that Rachel and Leah um, were jealous, um, unimportant anecdotes of country life, stories of springs, of watering troughs and such as are told in the, in the bedchamber. Um, attractive enough to read, yet everything but historical occurrences. And he says, such minor incidents arouse no public interest when they took place. The historian does not report them, but popular tradition and legend delight in such details. So what do you guys think about his differentiation between that? Like the, the legend focuses on minor details, or includes a lot more of them, say at least, than history, which focuses on a broader, um, has a much more broad, Public focus. There, they were. It's everything is put in a legend. Everything is put in a myth for a reason. Um, if you look at some of the commentary that was developed afterwards and written down about some of this stuff, a lot of it deals with Jewish law about why they're doing things, or so and so had to do this because of this, or so and so didn't eat this food because it was unclean. And so this happened, or he couldn't legally marry so and so, so she would be a concubine, or so. So I think that because we're far removed from the culture itself, we don't understand the nuances that went into it on why they would be included. It's kind of like the long drawn out book. There's like a whole book in the Iliad devoted almost to the the making of Achilles' shield, and it's amazing. It goes into extreme detail, painstakingly deep, like detailed what was on it, what the people were doing, the imagery, everything. But it's there for a reason, you know, and, and scholars can write commentary on that and figure that out, and, and it's just fascinating stuff once you dig into it. Oh, and no, I just want to point out here that wouldn't surprise me one bit. If they had a form of specialization of writing in terms of various different events, like history focused on a broader aspect, but I'm pretty sure even then they understood my formations of detailing certain things like ancient artifacts. So there's possibly reasons where which those types of books or where in which those types of uh, details might be historical to some particular degree, uh, depending on the way in which it's written and the way in which it's done so. If it's not related to, like, you know, uh, let's say, for example, a hero's shield, uh, is that really describing a hero's shield as he wore it, or, or, or is he relating it to the character, or is he simply just describing the shield because this looks like the shield from that hero because it fits the depictions of various artistic forms, it fits the various legends. So we're going to detail this for later people to examine. Uh, you know, I'm pretty sure that they had that sort of mindset, really. Uh, but yeah.
But um, in regards to, it seems to me like he's describing that the two genres, history versus legend, have a, a different focus. So while you might find personal mundane details in history here and there, and you might find broader political uh, overarching things in legend, it seems that the primary focus of legend, in his opinion, or not the primary focus necessarily, but that it contains way more of these personal, seemingly meaningless to a nation as a whole details, whereas history, while it may contain some, should barely contain any and may almost exclusively deal with these major things. Like, do you guys agree with his classification in that respect of history versus legend? Uh, I would have to be more familiar with, uh, with the literature in, in terms of what he's referring to, so I, I'm not too sure if I can throw my weight behind it, but generally I would agree in general principle, but you know, when it comes to specifics, I, I'm not too sure. Okay. Uh, now that Wayne is back, um, we had uh, chatted briefly the other day. I think I mentioned this to you, Doug, earlier on Facebook, that um, I'll tell you what my problem is with this book is it seems to be a little bit out of date because mm -hmm. I'm reading um, a book called The Mythic Past by um, Thomas L. Thompson. And his basic understanding is, and this is like only since the 90s, so when we're dealing with Gunkel, we're going even further back. But uh, he's basically saying, you know, a lot of these things that they consider history is not really history at all that even when you're looking at a book like second samuel as gunkel does as history it's really <laughs> it's <laughs> yeah i'm a fanboy <clears throat> it's really uh, not because uh, well i can actually find it um, here real quick and i can read it to you just briefly part of the uh, preface to the book where he just sums it up um, Basically, he's saying the Bible is only a Hellenistic Bible that we know of, namely the one that we first begin to read in the text found among the Dead Sea Scrolls near Qumran. I have argued that the quest for origins is not an historical quest, but a theological and literary question, a question about meaning. To give it an historical form is to attribute to it our own search for meaning. Biblical scholarship used to believe that we might understand the Bible if we could only get back to its origins. The question about origins, however, is not an answerable one. Not only is the Bible's, quote, Israel, unquote, a literary fiction, but the Bible begins as a tradition already established, a stream of stories, song, and philosophical reflection, collected, discussed, and debated. Our sources do not begin. They lie already in medias res, which means with no preamble, I guess you would say it would be. <clears throat> so did you get the gist of that, what that's going, what, what he's on about there? Yeah, I think so. Is he, is he basically saying that basically our earliest copy of, the, of these texts, namely from the Dead Sea Scrolls, that they're all basically purely um, cultural legend stories to, you know, that have some like we said earlier, rhetorical purpose or mythical purpose, and that there's no history in, within the pages of them? Yeah, because he's saying that um, to even ask about origins is probably gains impetus, like some of the people were mentioning, uh, uh, Herodotus and things. It's uh, You know, at one point, uh, the Greeks discovered the Hebrews and said, where's your origin stories? You know, so at that point, they produced them tracing it back to the beginning of the world, which is what the, uh, Greek sensibilities expected from history. Um, anyway, that's what I was saying. So, you know, to me, yeah, it's interesting to read Gunkel on that, but this history of religion school doesn't take into account some modern things, some modern things that we could do, and we could read some of those, like uh, Philip R. Davies would be a good, good author to look at and also uh, Thomas L. Thompson. And also, if you want to get into the archaeology, there's the Bible on Earth that I suggested to uh, Wayne. Yeah, I definitely would like to, you know, this is just the start. You know, it's a, I thought it would be fun to start with the early book on the first book of the Bible. So, 
But yeah, obviously, there's been a lot of criticism of foreign criticism in general, and that it's not necessarily totally widely applicable. You know, it ignores rhetorical function. Um, so yeah, it's it's def We're just kind of reading the book to discuss it, basically. Um, just out of just out of curiosity, how far along are you in terms of studying the Bible? I could probably re recommend quite a few uh, te uh, teaching company lectures for you. You'd have to get them from the library because they're expensive as shit. But yeah. Oh. Um, I mean, I have a ton of books on my bookshelf. I haven't read a ton yet. Um, I'm familiar with some of the broad, major things, but as far as like de details and being super widely read, I'm definitely not. Ah, okay. Okay, then. Well, yeah. well still, I'm, I'm going to throw you the Great Courses site, and you can check out some of the TTC, uh, the teaching company's lectures here. They, yeah, they have, I've listened to a few of those, but not all of them. Yeah, yeah. So, hold on for a second. The ones on religion are probably the best. They mostly have Christian stuff, but they have a lot of interesting stuff with, with regards to history. There are a few lectures by Bart Ehrman now, pretty damn good. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're a lot, the lectures that he does are a lot more accessible for me uh, than his books because, to be perfectly honest, I, I don't know, maybe it's because of sub, maybe it's because I know everything that he's talking about, but he tends to write, when he does his popular books, he, it's just boring. Like, I know most of what he's talking about, and there are a few instances where I don't know what he's talking about, but it's interesting to say the least. Mm -hmm. yeah. He's not like Robert Price, one which every single time I read one of his books, I find something fascinating to dig through. Um, you know, it's just it's just a little sort of thing of mine. But uh, yeah, here's the uh, here's the link for the course here. And you know, one of the books, though I will say that I am liking is his book uh, Forged. I, I mean, I mean, not Forged, not. Uh, forgery and counter forgery is what I'm talking about. I haven't gotten through that one because it's pretty damn thick, but it's pretty fucking good. Um, so yeah, I guess that's... Did anyone else have to say anything about Chapter 1? About any thoughts they had? Well, what I want to do is uh, just give an example, a biblical example of what he might be talking about by history and legend. And it's a great example to use from uh, Hebrew literature is uh, Judges 4 and 5. So Judges 4, you have the actual event on everything that happened in the battle. Judges 5 is the Song of Deborah, which is the poetry about what happened in the battle. So, mm -hmm. so both chapters are almost the same, cover the same topic, but just in different formats. It's it's a yeah. beautiful example. So you're saying in that example we have ostensibly history right next to legend. Correct. Okay, yeah. Now, John, do you think Thompson would even recognize those the differences that Gunkel points out as far as the focus of the two genres? So 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 I'm assuming he wouldn't agree that anything is necessarily historical in in here, but there does seem to be some kind of systematic difference of, of the focus as far as its broadness versus personal level um, through through some of these sections. Do you think he would recognize that difference? And if he would, you know, what's the the purpose of the difference? You know. Uh, that's a good question. Um, I think you would recognize them as two genres of the same type of literature. Okay. Yeah. So one would be a poetic expression of what appears to be history on the other side, but isn't really. It's kind of like a saga, saga set next to poetry. Neither one, both should be considered legendary, I would imagine. Now, uh, what was their second part of the question? Um. Well, you're saying that saga would be the more historically sounding stuff and that poetry would be the stuff that tends to focus on a lot more of the mundane personal details. Is that what you mean? Um, yeah, kind of in a way, but I don't think you would see it exactly that way. Okay. Um, do you even agree with his distinction there that, that 
that um, some of the stories, especially some of the stuff in Genesis, tend to have a much greater focus on these, you know, minute, mundane, personal details versus some of the other stuff that tends to deal with broader public, political stuff and doesn't really seem to have a focus at all on these kinds of little details. Yeah, that's why I think you would consider them kind of like in the saga genre of literature is because they're not dealing the same way uh, that other histories, even from ancient times, are written, that they're focused on family, things like that. M you know, uh, not the exact the stuff that be it makes for, you know, you wouldn't see a whole lot of that in uh, Julius Caesar, like, you know, the day-to-day <laughs> Uh, things that go on, but rather more broadly, you know. Yeah. Um, so anyway, chapter one was kind of an introduction where you just hit a few highlights, I guess. Um, chapter two is where he kind of gets into breaking down the different types of legends. So um, he starts off, um, he says, in the great mass of are materials, two groups are distinctly recognizable. One, the legends of the origin of the world and of the progenitors of the human race, remember, not just of Israel, um, the stories down to the Tower of Babel, their locality being remote, and their spheres of interest the whole world. And two, the legends of the patriarchs of Israel, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, um, and the latter sons, um, the locality and sphere of interest being Canaan and adjacent lands. So again, he's kind of identifying two different focuses on some of the material in Genesis. And he's saying within these two different, also within these two different um, categories, he's saying that um, I'll just read, the narratives of the first group speak of God in a different way from that of the legends of the patriarchs. So that by the time we're talking about the patriarchs, um, yeah, in the latter, the divinity appears always enveloped in a mystery, in mystery, unrecognized or speaking out of heaven, or perhaps only in a dream. In the earlier legends, on the contrary, God walks intimately among men, and no one marvels at it. In the legend of paradise, men dwell in God's house. It is assumed that he is in the habit of visiting them every evening. He even closes the ark for Noah and appears to him in person, attracted by his sacrifice. Furthermore, in the legends of the patriarchs, the real actors are always men. If the divinity appears, it is regarded as an exception. So, again, he's making that contrast in the way that the immediacy of God's interaction is distinguished. I don't know. I, I would have to disagree with the writer there. Uh, Hagar, God appears to Hagar. God talks to Sarah. I mean, that was among the patriarchs. Even though originally he did come to men, like, I don't know, it seems that... I, I'm not really sure what, what point he's trying to get at and what he believes the division is. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, it, it seems that, like, as soon as as soon as I read that, I already know of a couple of examples. Otherwise, you know, that I don't know. Yeah, I think he's saying, like he says here, that um, um, God walking among men seems to be um, a habit. You know, his his direct, immediate interaction is assumed to be commonplace. Whereas in what you're talking about, the examples you gave. He 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 um, acknowledges them, but he says they appear to be regarded as an exception to the rule rather than the rule itself. Do you agree with that or no? Like, for example, the appearance to Hagar, Sarah, etc. Ah, uh, I don't know. Like, like I don't think. I don't think uh, e even the angels or, or the uh, messengers went to Lot physically. You know, that's part of the patriarchs. 
Mm-hmm. Um, I know that's not a female, but he's still he's still concerned with what's going on enough to go down there and see. Um, you know, that's why I'm trying to find it tough. If if all right, I I think what I'm having a hard time with if if like I was saying before, if if he's saying that during the primeval history, the divine was dealing with the whole world, and then after. Uh, Genesis chapter 11, after all the primeval history, he moves into Abraham dealing with an individual. I can see that happening. Going from dealing with the whole world to dealing with an individual to uh, the patriarch of of the formation of a nation or the beginning of a nation. Yeah, Uh, I I could agree with that, but as far as interacting with people, uh, it's tough because you, you got you got uh, the birth of Samson, um, where the messenger of God, like you know, like Doctor Price was saying in one of his episodes, that you know they didn't think that you could see God face to face, so they kind of cloaked it with a messenger or, or whatever. But the people say, "Oh, I've seen God face to face." Manoah did 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 that on the on the birth of Samson. Um, I think it was Manoah. Um, and and other things. Uh, Samuel here's 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 God in, you know, the temple and and talks to Eli. So I mean, uh, you know, it's it's fascinating. Like like just reading that, you know, I already thought of some examples. So so I don't know. Like I'm, I'm having a hard time getting at what he's trying to say. Like maybe I'm just misunderstanding what he's trying to do. Yeah. Um, just he 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 does go on to say this distinction that is between the two categories uh, to be sure is to be sure only relative for some of the legends of the patriarchs, notably those connected with Hebron and Penuel, represent the divinity as appearing in the same way. On the other hand, the story of Cain and Abel and that of the cursing of Canaan, in which human beings are the chief actors, are among the primitive legends. So, yeah, I guess he's saying that some of the stories just seem to have God interacting in a more immediate fashion, but that doesn't by itself necessarily denote the primitiveness or modernness, relatively speaking, of the particular story. But just that... in. It, to the extent that God is interacting very immediately, he, he sees those as being more mythical in character. You also have to situate Gunkel in, in history in that he was uh, more in focus with the evolution of religions, mm-hmm. the school of, uh, school of religions, and that was itself a reaction against uh, documentary hypothesis guys. So whereas documentary hypothesis guys like Wellhausen would say that these are different sources mixed around and that there's no actual progression from a more anthropomorphic deity as depicted in early in Genesis, at it's the same sources that are depicting God anthropomorphically later on, and it's and then Gunkel has to account for that within his evolutionary theory about you know how that. Because, you know, like in the story of Hagar, which I believe it says that she saw an angel of the Lord. The text specifically says that. But then she says, I have seen God face to face. So, you know, there's always, in these later stories, uh, you know, a difference. And a lot of it beco- comes from the sources. But I think Gunkel just has a different theory. Yeah, he here he does kind of address something along those lines. He says... This is later on in chapter 2, Antiquity of the Legends. These legends have not hitherto received full justice, even when it has been recognized that they are legends. Even the most superficial reader can distinguish for himself the chief original sources in Genesis from which the present redaction was constructed, now commonly called the writings of the Elohist, of the Yavist, and of the Priestly Code. Since the sources of the Elohist and the Yavist were written down in the 9th or 8th century BC, which I don't know if that's changed. Um, Some common commentators have been disposed to think that the legends themselves 
originated in the main in the age of the Israelitish kingdom and furnished therefore no revelations of primitive history. But in reality, these legends are much older. The tribal and race names which they preserve are almost all forgotten in other records. We know nothing of Shem, Ham, and Japheth, of Abel and Cain, of Esau and Jacob, nothing of Hagar, and scarcely anything of Ishmael from the historical records of Israel. Hence we must conclude that these races all belong to prehistoric times. This is particularly evident in the case of Jacob and Esau, who were, to be sure, identified later with Israel and Edom. Um, but this very lapping of names, as well as many features of the legend which are not applicable to Israel and Edom, as, for instance, the treaties between the city of Gerar and the sons of Abraham, or Isaac, concerning the possession of certain wells, um, especially that of Beersheba, show us that the old narrative originally had in mind entirely different races. Um, in the legend, Jacob is not disposed to war. In the, history of Israel, in the history, Israel conquered Edom in war. In the legend, Esau is stupid. In history, he is famous for his wisdom. Um, and to be honest, that last part kind of perplexed me. Well, it's it's kind of like playing the part of Hamlet, meaning that oh, okay, you could be wise for a reason, or you could play the part of the fool for a reason. That means you're wise. So it's kind of like, well, I don't want to um, do a whole lot of work here because all my teammates are a bunch of bums. So I better like pretend I'm crazy and slack off a little bit because if I take charge, I'm going to be doing it all. You know, so. I think that showing him as kind of the character who fumbles around a little bit, but in the end gets the upper hand because Jacob ends up giving him all these gifts because he's afraid that Esau is going to attack him. You know, in the end, you know, he does win, even though he doesn't totally get the birthright back. He gets some kind of payment. Right. Yeah, but he does. He does definitely seem to be assuming, it, if not history some more primitive form or or at least some more primitive purpose of the legend than than just assuming that they I guess he's saying originated from the time of the um, our best dating of the sources is that what you guys got out of that of what I just read there Yeah, I, I think the reason why I'm having a hard time with this is because um, it's kind of like an older idea, and, I'm, and I'm, mm -hmm. it sounds strange, but I'm trying to get used to it and get into his framework and what he was trying to think about. But so much has been built on, on that, on what myth is and the importance of it and symbolism and all that has been built on. Yeah. Then. So I'm trying to... It's almost like I'm trying to get in reverse, but I, I really can't throw the transmission in the reverse, you know? Yeah, I totally agree, yeah. And even the, from what I've read about his writings and his approach anyway, a lot has changed. So this isn't, this isn't supposed to be like the definitive explanation of the myths in Genesis. So it's just uh, the origination of form criticism and his approach, basically. Because I think it's fun to look at, even if it's outdated and maybe even obsolete to some extent, I think it's still fun to look at um, some of the way these older guys, you know, especially in this case, one that kind of originated a whole new school of criticism, um, viewed these materials. Yeah, I'm not saying that, um, you know, it's it's a bad thing or, like, super outdated and I I guess what I'm saying is, like, since I'm working my souped-up computer right now, it'd be really yeah. hard for me yeah. to go back and, and run an old IBM, you know? <laughs> yeah, definitely. I, I forget yeah. all the key. I forget all the keystrokes. <laughs> yeah, I see what you're saying for sure. Um, so David was asking about faded myths. Um, so he says some legends are faded myths. Um, myths. Let no one shrink from the word, are stories of the gods in contradistinction to the legends in which the actors are men. 
Stories of the gods are in all nations the oldest narratives. The legend is a literary variety. I'm sorry, the legend as a literary variety has its origin in myths. Accordingly, when we find that these primitive legends are akin to myths, we must infer that they have come down to us in a comparatively ancient form. They come from a period of Israel's history when the childlike belief of the people had not yet fully arrived at the conception of a divinity whose operations are shrouded in mystery. On the other hand, these, in other words, less immediate. Um, on the other hand, these original myths have reached us in comparatively faded colors. This we can perceive in the narratives themselves, where we are able in some points to reconstruct an older form of the story than the one transmitted to us. Notably, Genesis chapter 6, verse 1 through 4 is nothing but a torso. We are led to similar conclusions when we compare the primitive legends with the allusions to myths which we find in the poets and prophets of the Old Testament and the later ap apocalyptic writers, as, for instance, the myths of Yahweh's combat with uh, Rahab or Leviathan, of the fall of Halal, and so on. The same result very clearly follows a comparison of the primitive legends of Genesis with the myths of the Orient, especially of the biblical story of the creation and the deluge, with the Babylonian versions of the same subjects. The colossal outlines, the, the peculiarly brilliant colors which characterize these myths in the original form are lost in a measure in the biblical legends of the beginnings of things. The equivalence of the divine beings and the objects or realms of nature, the combat of the gods with one another, the birth of the gods are some of the features which have disappeared in the version of Genesis. So he's saying that the legends we're reading in the text are seem to be um, not quite the most primitive form, is what he's saying, that they've been toned down a little bit. And then he goes on to say that the, the development of monotheism, he's saying, is responsible for that change. Yeah, but I, I think, too, uh, the way we look at myth we have done it to ourselves, and I think gradually humans have had muted the colors through history on themselves. Um, Karen Armstrong had an excellent quote on that on her book. Uh, I think it was uh, oh, short his history of myth. Our modern er alienization from myth is unprecedented. In the pre-modern world, mythology was indispensable. It not only helped people to make sense of their lives, but also revealed regions of the human mind that would otherwise have remained inaccessible. It was an early form of psychology. The stories of gods, heroes descending into the underworld, treading through labyrinths, fighting monsters, brought to light the mysterious workings of the psyche, showing people how to cope with their own interior crisis. When Freud and Jung began to chart the modern quest for the soul, they instinctively turned to classical mythology to explain their insights and gave the old myths new interpretations. So, you know, each generation gives these myths new interpretations and thereby muting what he's saying, the original. But why do we change it? Because we need to, because the old myth no longer speaks to us and, and, and contains what we need. So we need to make it relevant in our own lives so these reinterpretations keep happening. At the same time, in some ways it dulls it, but it adds color in others. You know, So it's really hard to say. It's also talking about two different things, though. You know, when, you, when you're studying myths as, like, say, a comparative mythologist, um, you're seeking to understand them, not reinterpret them. You know. Yeah. Um, he, he talks about, in his view, like you were saying, Wayman, that to a later generation, the myths might not have served the purpose they needed to or wanted it to have served. And he, he argues that, or he goes on to argue that he thinks the, the eventual development of monotheism had that same repurposing effect of the earlier myths. Um, and we find in, the, in Genesis that repurposed myth. Um, um, he says, in all this we can see the essential character of the religion of Israel. The fundamental trait of the religion of Yahweh is unfavorable to myths. For this religion, from its very beginning, tends towards monotheism. 
But for a story of the gods, at least two gods are essential, which yeah, I don't know if I agree with that. Therefore, the Israel which we observe in the Old Testament could not tolerate genuine unmodified myths, at least not in prose. The poet was excused for occasional allusions to myths. Hence, in poetry, we find preserved traces of a point of view older um, than that of the tradition of Genesis, one frankly familiar with myths. But the primitive legends preserved to us are all dominated by this unspoken aversion to mythology. Now, what do you guys think of that, that the main part that um, there seem to be hints of an earlier form in the stories even as we have them today, of an earlier form of these myths. Uh, Margaret Barker like, has, I think, written a, a lot about that, and Dr. Price on the Bible Geek has alluded to it a zillion times. About, yeah, like you know, in the book of Job, where Rahab and Leviathan can be seen as an earlier version of the creation myths. Yeah, and he, and that's, and he, he, he talks about... Um, you know, Yahweh was just one of the gods of the nations and eventually took control. He, he's kind of saying that, and maybe he's not talking specifically about that, but he's saying that there seem to be hints within the texts as we have now of earlier forms of these same myths, and that because of the development of monotheism, there were certain elements of these myths that weren't conducive to the new thought form, I guess, and were kind of papered over or reinterpreted. Um, what do you guys think about that? Or, or accidentally left in. You know, that's kind of humorous, yeah. too, when, you know, you find little gems like that. I love it. Like uh, 1 Kings 22, uh, 19, we, we, get, we get a uh, view of the heavenly council and the things going on and, and the first section of Job, you know, where we receive the, uh, the workings of the, of the divine council or the heavens, uh, you know, where it says, you know, um, I don't know, where, where is it? Uh, I don't want to read the wrong um, version here. But uh, 1 Kings 22, um, 19. Micah said, Therefore hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne, and all the hosts of heaven standing by him on his right and on his left. And the Lord said, Who will go and entice Ahab to go up to Rothmoth Gilead? And one said this, while the other said that. So, so they're debating, you know, that's fascinating. And a spirit came forward and stood before the Lord and said, I will entice him. So, I mean, you know, that's almost like some of a snapshot of the pantheon, you know, mm -hmm. that later is definitely a no-no. But even in Genesis, you know, there's traces of myth even there. I don't know exactly why Gunkel is saying that there's, that one is more mythical than the other. I mean, yeah, it's been toned down in Genesis 1, say, but it's, like you said, Wayman, there are little tidbits and gems still embedded in the text. Yeah, of an earlier overarching form of the myth. I think he, where, he, where he talks about the degrees of how mythical it is, he, he says one of his main points is that you can look at how, again, I don't want to beat a dead horse, but again, how immediate God's interaction in the world is versus some other stories where he's doing it through some intermediary, you know. And again, I don't, I don't necessarily think that that is a, con a, a conclusive distinction, just something he's arguing. Because yeah, he seems to have like an unspoken assumption that certain things are more advanced than others. For instance, yeah. Genesis 1 is a more advanced, somehow quasi-scientific, maybe he's thinking, or more historically based than, uh, say, Genesis 2 or the legends that are uh, relayed in Job and other places. But, you know, it's, to me, I think I had the same kind of feeling when you were thinking about you need two gods to have a myth. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. the same thing, you know, you don't need, I mean, you can still have myth even though it gives the appearance of something else. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I'm just kind of reading ahead. Um, he says one interesting thing here on, in the section, the significance of myths. He says that, Thus the creation of the world is painted as spring on a grand scale, and the overflows of the rivers of the Mesopotamia of Mesopotamia gave rise to the story of the deluge. 
I just thought that was kind of an interesting little thing. Mainly the the creation story being kind of the coming on of spring writ large and on a cosmic scale. I don't know if that's a real clear connection, but I thought it was an interesting. Could have been one. There's probably other sources as well. Yeah, definitely. Um, but he's referring to like the origin of the story in Mesopotamia, not specifically the Bible, right? Right. Just those those forms of the myth in general, whether or not they come from Babylonia or the stuff we're reading in the Bible. Well, here's an interesting theory I, I heard about uh, flood myths and why they're so universal. And uh, it was there are some tribes, I believe, Aborigines in Australia, that they navigate through their through their line through kind of like uh, metaphorical stories. So when they need to travel from point A to point B, they have a story connected with the route that they take, and you know you got to turn left at this tree and go along the sea for so many periods of you know so many steps and so forth. And over time, as say like sea levels change. The story has to change to take into account that that some of the that route is no longer above above water anymore. So some of these legends can kind of like come out of the fact that you know, well, our ancestors once told the story of how they had to pass through a certain land and now it's flooded and things like that. So you know, it, it's an interesting. It, I didn't. It wasn't convincing to me, but I thought it'd be interesting to just mention that it doesn't necessarily have to be because there's particular schools schools that say the origins of say the gods and myths are one set of phenomena like uh, meteorological phenomena, and then there's another group that say okay the gods are born out of astronomical observations and things like that, and the other ones that come well, these you know religion came out of vegetation and agriculture. So that's just one possible theory, and Gunkel is a, of a particular set, school of religion set that had made certain assumptions about religions that kind of govern their overall approach to everything. Yeah, I hadn't heard that one before. I tend to think that it, that they came about from a bunch of different factors, namely that they witnessed real floods and probably imagined, you know, fantastic scale, fantastic scale floods, you know, that they could hike up into the mountains and find obvious fossils of sea creatures and didn't know how they got up there because they didn't have any conception of plate tectonics. Um, I could just imagine a bunch of different things kind of coming together that they saw where they would say, hey, maybe, you know, this was underwater at some point because of a flood or, you know. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I remember that discussion we had with Nephilim Free, and it's like you just cannot convince him that uh, people can extrapolate yeah. from some minor natural phenomenon and be able to write at large through human imagination. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, he would not accept that, which I think it's perfectly natural to, you know, that might not be the actual right explanation, but it doesn't seem far-fetched to me. You know, it doesn't seem like a stretch to imagine something like that happening. Not just in the case of the flood, but in things in general. And this is a great segue into the main point of chapter two is he, he calls a lot of these stories etiological. They serve an etiological purpose in that they're meant to explain the origin of a name of a place or a tribe of people um, or maybe even a geological feature. Uh, basically an explanation of origin of something. And then he goes on and, and, and classifies them into, into subcategories. Um, sorry, I'm just reading my notes here. Yeah, so Legends of the Patriarchs. He says, um, In earliest times, the individual man counts for little. There is much more interest in the destinies of the race. The tribe, the nation, are regarded as real entities much more than at present day. Thus it comes that the destinies of the race are regarded as being the destinies of a person. 
the race sighs, triumphs, is dejected, rebels, dies, comes to life again, etc. Thus, too, the relations of races are regarded as the relations of individuals. Two races, it is said, are brothers, for example, are closely related and equal. Um, if one of them is regarded as richer, stronger, or nobler, it is said to be the firstborn brother, or it comes of a better mother, while the other is younger, or comes of a concubine. Israel being divided into twelve tribes, we are told that the tribal ancestor of Israel had twelve sons, some of these tribes having a closer union with one another. They are said to come from one mother. The relation of mother and son exists between Hagar and Ishmael, the more distant relation of uncle and nephew between Abraham and Lot. So for the in the case of the patriarchs, he's saying that they see their etiological purpose would be that the these patriarchs are a narrative embodiment or literary embodiment of tribes as a whole. And that the particular relationships and events in their life are actually meant to be explanations of events that happened to the tribe or were thought to have happened to the tribe. Um, what do you guys think about that? Hopefully yeah. he goes into more different ones because there's other... Definitely. Okay, yeah. all right, good. That's just, <laughs> he's just laying out the broad case. Because there's other ones, yeah. Um, yeah, so in the next section, what do you guys think of that idea in general, though? Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I tend to think that, like, it, it also would tell a tribe how to relate to another tribe in more modern times if the legend or if somebody, you know, oh, why why, why do we treat so-and-so like that? Well, you know, and you tell them the story. Or, you know, how come this tribe here lives so far away? Well, I don't know, a long time ago, you know, and you have the legend. And, and I think that, you know, that, that all relates back to where you're at in your own space, in your own tribe, in your own national identity. It, it solidifies that. Mm -hmm. um, Wayne, I'm trying to keep up on people that aren't able to use a mic right now. Wayne says, I think the ideological aspects are definitely there, but are still mostly fictional. Um, so that, are you saying that even the things they're being meant to describe are fictional? He says, like, I don't buy that Lot's wife turning into a pillar of salt was actually meant to explain any particular pillar of salt. Rather, I see it merely as a way the author tries to add verisimilitude to the story. I also don't believe Genesis has any shadows of history about actual tribes. I think it's just pure storytelling. Reuben says we have that pillar of salt even today, Wayne. Okay, so anyway, um, did anyone have any have anything anything more to say about the general idea of patriarchs possibly being um, embodiments of the tribe, or a tribe. Otherwise, I'll go on to more specifics. I'll take that as a no. Um, sorry, John. I was just saying that that's still a current idea, I suppose. So, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Go on. <laughs> now, I don't know if he originated this idea, um, Gunkel. Um, I don't know if you guys know if he did or not. It wouldn't be a stretch, I guess, considering he's he's credited with um, uh, basically inventing form criticism. So, but I don't know if this specific patriarchs equals tribes thing is his idea. Um, patriarchs represent tribes. We are not putting a new meaning into the legends which treat of such race individuals when we regard their heroes, Ishmael, Jacob, Esau, and others, as tribes and try to interpret the stories about them as tribal events. We are simply getting at their meaning as it was understood in primitive times in Israel. On the other hand, we must go about this attempt with caution, for we, we must reckon with the possibility that some of these figures do not originally represent tribes, 
but only came to be regarded as patriarchs in a later time. And further, after the figures of the patriarchs had once become established as the heroes of epic legends, that legends of other sorts and wanting the basis of tribal history became attached to these. Um, and then he goes on to say obvious examples of personifications of tribes. Um, Ishmael, Ammon, Moab, the 12 tribes and their divisions. Um, sometimes it is perfectly evident from the narratives themselves that we have to do with tribes, as in the case of Cain and Abel, Jacob and Esau, Ham and Japheth. Because even earlier than that, you, you know, like uh, the, tr the people who uh, descended from Noah, they all just happen to come from a guy named Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Yeah. So those are etiologies as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, so just to go on, I hate to read a lot of it, but he can say it more concisely than I yeah. can. Yeah, also, too, like Cain went out and you know, started a city, so, yeah, that's fascinating. There must have um, been multiple Cain's. Cain the Wanderer, Cain the City Builder, maybe a couple others. Um, he, he goes on to say, once in ancient times, so we may assume, there were conflicts over wells between the citizens of Gerar and the neighboring Bedouins ending in a compromise at Beersheba. The legend depicts these affairs as a war and a treaty between Abimelech, king of Gerar, and the patriarchs called in the legend Abraham and, or Isaac. Now, what do you guys think about that specific connection there? That that story is really just meant to explain that there were conflicts over wells between citizens of Gerar and the, and the Bedouins and that it ended up um, and a compromise at Beersheba. Is he saying that uh, that's the extent of it? That's the entire notion that's trying to get across because you know I think there's a lot of theology going on in there where you know uh, I can't say it because I don't know the uh, story that well that I could just expound on it like a Dr. Price <laughs> but you know uh, how Abraham's eventual compromises worked in the story a lot of times that favors a particular theological outlook Yahweh's favoring of, you know, Abraham over these other people. So it, it's got to be just more than just explaining some kind of folksy interaction between neighboring peoples. Yeah. He goes on and cites um, Dinah, the daughter of Jacob, is seduced by Shechem, and in punishment Shechem is treacherously, treacherously assaulted by Dinah's brothers. Um, Jacob, however, abjures the brothers and curses them. The history at the bottom of this is probably as follows. Dinah, an Israelitish family, is overpowered by the Canaanitish city of Shechem and then treacherously avenged by Simeon and Levi, the most closely related tribes. Uh, but the other tribes of Israel renounce them and allow the two tribes to be destroyed. So he's trying to He's trying to, it seems like he's trying to imagine some broader historical event that these stories are meant to be des describing, describing. Is that right? I think uh, Shechem was one of the holy sites, one of the early holy sites. So that, that plays a part in the Abimelech's story also. Mm -hmm. It's also the first place Abraham stopped in his entrance into Canaan.
yeah, he, he goes on to a bunch of other examples. I won't read them all, but um, he's got a bunch in here. Um, yeah, well, here's a, the one I found interesting. Um, in these legends, the clearest matter is the character of the races. Here is Esau, the huntsman of the steppes, living with little reflection from hand to mouth, forgetful, magnanimous, brave, and hairy as a goat. And there is Jacob, the herdsman, a smooth man, more cunning and accustomed to look into the future. His uncle Laban is the type of the um, Aramean, Aramean, avaricious and deceitful, but to outward appearance is an excellent and upright, upright man, never at, a lo at loss for an excuse. A more noble figure is Abraham, hospitable, peaceful, a model of piety. Um, anyway, I'll just move on. So the, he, he keeps talking about ideological legends, that they're meant to explain some origin of something. And now we're getting into the subdivisions. Eth the first one is ethnological legends. Um, there is a desire to know the reasons for the relations of tribes. Why is Canaan the servant of his brethren? Why has Japheth such an extended territory? Why do the children of Lot dwell in the inhospitable east? How does it come that Reuben lost his birthright? Why must Cain wander about a restless fugitive? Uh, why is sevenfold vengeance proclaimed against the slayer of Cain? Why is Gilead the border between Israel and the Arameans? Why does Beersheba belong to us and not the people of Gerar? Why is Shechem in possession of Joseph? Why have, uh, why have we a right to the holy places at Shechem and uh, Machpelah? Why has Ishmael become a Bedouin people with just this territory and this God? How does it come that the Egyptian peasants have to bear the heavy tax of the fifth, while the fields of the priests are exempt? And with a special frequency, the question was asked, how does Israel come to have this glorious land of Canaan? So that he's saying that these questions would have been in the minds of way back in Israelites, and that the attempt to explain these um, situations they found themselves in would have been these, that these stories would have been meant to explain these, um, these situations, basically. I, know, I, I tend to think that those kinds of examples would be more modern. And I'll tell you why. Because what you're doing is explaining to your subjects, if you're a monarch, trying to build a national uh, cohesive nation where everybody came from and the reasons why things were as they were, whether it's history or legend. And no matter how or what it takes to get it done, to form the glue that would bind a nation together, um, you use it, you know, and to me it would be something that would be in a united kingdom uh, explaining all these things looking back, not necessarily the people back there wondering about it. You know? I, think, I think that is what he's saying. I think Maybe I'm wrong. I, I could be misinterpreting it, but I think he, he is saying pretty much what you said. Do, do you guys feel like that he's that that's not right, that he's not saying that? Okay, I get you. Yeah, maybe I was just hearing it wrong or something. Yeah, in other words, you know, they had these questions like, why do the children of Lot dwell in the inhospitable East? Well, this is how, and they invented the story regarding Lot and why he dwells in the inhospitable East. And... Um, uh, the main question, he says, why does Israel come to have this glorious land of Canaan? And then, you know, there are all these sub-questions about how that ultimately came about. So whatever time you say they originated, I think is, you may say that they're, they come from a later time. I don't know what he's saying exactly as far as how far back these particular ones go, but ultimately that they're meant to describe and maybe even also serve some rhetorical purpose like you said some um, political purpose maybe but also he's emphasizing that they that they serve um, a purpose to explain the origin of some of these um, situations they find themselves in or circumstances of their life or nation or whatever 
So that's ethnological. Why this tribe is he living here, why these tribes are, have you know, this particular relationship with each other, etc. And so these patriarchs, the stories are invented to explain all that through the lives of these patriarchs that are symbolic of the tribes themselves. So we pretty much already talked about that. <laughs> Um, then, real quick, he talks about etymological legends. Um, ancient, Israel, ancient Israel spent much thought upon the origin and the real meaning of the names of races, mountains, wells, sanctuaries, and cities. Um, and then he talks about current examples. Many of our current names, such as Rhine, Mosel, Neckar, Harz, Berlin, London, Thames, Seine, etc., are equally unintelligible to those not trained in philology. Um, he goes on to some more modern examples. And then from the examples, he says, similar legends are numerous in Genesis and in later works. The city of Babel is named from the fact that God there confused human tongues. Balal, which I'm assuming is a Hebrew word, which means confusion. I don't know, Reuben, you can correct me on that. I'm just making an assumption that I don't speak Hebrew. Um, Jacob is interpreted as heel holder because at birth he held his brother, whom he robbed of the birthright, by the heel. Zoar means trifle because Lot said appealingly, quote, it is only a trifle. Beersheba is the well of seven because Abraham there gave Abimelech seven lambs. Isaac, or Yishak, is said to have his name from the fact that his mother laughed, which in Hebrew, sahak or shahak, when his birth was foretold to her. She, she laughed about it. Um, and so forth. So what do you guys think about that in regards to the names? I don't know. If, if you take Hitchcock's uh, Dictionary of Names or Hebrew uh, Persons and, and look through some of that and the meanings, it's pretty amazing. Like... Uh, I did that one time, you know, just, just read through some of that. And it's funny to see myth and legend at play because a lot of times you can tell the story uh, about the person and the name was given probably, you know, way after the event or some event, some small event connected to that, that legend built up around you know, where I don't know how you would know if in the womb somebody was holding somebody's heel, you know? Yeah. <laughs> or, you know, well, and, and then that brings up, you know, the idea of uh, Abraham and his name change. You yeah. know, like, uh, okay, he's a father of nations, so uh, what, what are we going to call him? Uh, you know. So was that his original name, or was that what legend panned it out to be once the story was starting to formulate, you know? Mm -hmm. It's amazing how, how mixed up it is. And we find similar things in the New Testament, too, like Joseph of Arimathea, best disciple town. Yeah, Jesus. Right, yeah. I mean, there's a ton of examples, so... It could be coincidence. Um, some are more clear than others. The connection between their the role of, and primary focus of their character in comparison to the meaning of their name versus little details like Jacob being born grasping his brother's heel, you know, and stealing his birthright. Um, and then he, and then he says. In order to realize the utter naivete of most of these interpretations, that is, by the Israelites of these names, they're wondering, where do these names come from? Consider that the Hebrew legend calmly explains the Babylonian name Babel from the Hebrew vocabulary, Babel, and that the writers are often satisfied with merely approximate similarities of sounds. For instance, Cain, more exactly, Kajin, from Kaniti, quote, I have murdered. Um, Reuben from Rabionji, I'm, I'm probably slaughtering the pronunciations, quote, he hath regarded my misery, etc. 
Every student of Hebrew knows that these are not satisfactory etymologies. Investigators have not always fully perceived the naive character of this theory of etymology, but have allowed themselves to be misled into uh, patching up some very unsatisfactory etymologies with modern appliances. In one case, many theologians even are wont to declare one of these explanations, a very ingenious one indeed, Yahweh, I am that I am, as an established etymology. But etymologies are not acquired by revelation. The etymological legends are especially valuable to us because they are especially clear, il clear illustrations of the etiological variety of legend. So he's saying that, I guess he's saying that it's clear from the stories that the etymology of these names or how the Israelites interpreted them is clear from the text and that they were mistaken or used bad methodology, like just superficial sound similarities. I guess that's what he's saying. But an interesting idea. Um, any th any other thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I think that's where the idea of the uh, apologist ruins it in some ways. Not ruins it, but uh, detracts from us finding actually what it really means because they've allowed it and they've taken the insufficient name um, and, and usage and made it mainstream, mm -hmm. the mainstream interpretation for it without actually pushing it to look in it because it didn't match maybe some theological view or they didn't want, feel that it was too sacred to dig into or, you know, I, I think that maybe that's why learning an ancient, uh, I mean, Hebrew or Greek is like extremely important in some ways. And even our dictionaries are so screwed up like you know, Strong's is, is very bent towards, you know, one way. You can tell by the way he interprets some Hebrew words. And then, you know, Briggs and other people are bent towards another. So it's, I mean, it's tough. Like, when you're dealing, when you're mixing beliefs and theology in with history and trying to interpret that together, oh, it's, it's a headache. You, you, you almost can't do it. Yeah. Um, I'm actually going to use the bathroom, so I'll be right back. Yeah, it's definitely the wine. Okay, so, um, hey, John, are you back yet? I don't know how long you're going to be gone. This this particular uh, legend I found really interesting, and I wanted to see what you guys thought about it as far as its ideological function. Take that as a no. Well, it's live, so we can watch it later. Um, ceremonial legends is the next one. Um, a lot of the stories he's saying are meant to describe why the Israelites, you know, partook or exercised certain ceremonies. Um, let me. There's a couple examples he gives. Um, when the children see their father perform all sorts of curious customs during the feast of the Passover, they will ask, and thus it is expressly told in Exodus um, chapter 12, verse 26, and um, 
chapter 13, verse 14. What does this mean? Um, and the story of the Passover is to be told them. A similar direction is given with relation to the 12 stones in the Jordan um, in Joshua chapter 4, verse 6, um, which the Father is to explain to the children as memorials of the passage of the Jordan. And so he goes on to say, in these examples then, we see clearly how such a legend is the answer to a question. Similarly, questions are asked with regard to the origin of circumcision and of the Sabbath. Uh, why the muscle of the thigh? Why do they anoint the holy stone of Bethel and deliver the tithes there? Why do we not sacrifice a child at Jeruel, as Yahweh commands, but instead a ram? Um, and he references Genesis chapter uh, 22. Why do our people limp, that is, perform a certain dance at the festival of Penuel? <clears throat> and then his explanations for those questions. We perform the rite of circumcision in memory of Moses, whose firstborn was circumcised as a redemption for Moses, whose blood God demanded. We rest on the seventh day because God, at the creation of the world, rested on the seventh day. A myth because God himself is the actor in it. The muscle of the thigh is sacred to us because God struck Jacob on the muscle while wrestling with him at Penuel. The stone at Bethel was first anointed by Jacob because it was his pillow in the night when God appeared to him. At Jeruel, this is the name of the scene of the sacrifice of Isaac, um, God at first demanded of Abraham his child, but afterward accepted a ram. We limp at Penuel in imitation of Jacob, who limped there when his hip was lamed in the wrestling with God, which, by the way, is a very immediate example of God's interaction in the world, wrestling with a man, and so on. Um, so what do you guys think about that? I, I kind of wasn't so sure on that. I, I mean, I don't think that these ceremonies and rituals would have just popped out ex nihilo and that they would need that they just somehow find themselves doing these things and have no idea why they are doing them and then that and so they invented these stories out of whole cloth to explain why they're just find themselves doing these weird things I don't know what do you guys think about that I, I think it's mostly to, to mark a certain event because what what is a ritual? You know, like a, rit a ritual is a reenactment of a supposed historical event uh, s for maybe theological reasons or community mm -hmm. reasons or national reasons uh, to create, like, cohesiveness in a group, maybe for spirituality, because all those things have a theological component to it. Yeah, you know, and definitely. It, it's kind of like a, it's not only uh, rituals you know, it's heritage being passed down. So when your children ask you, you know, what is this, you tell them because it's, it's part of the, the cultural history. So, so when you're nation building, um, that is uh, strictly uh, defining which rituals you will perform as opposed to maybe what you've done before, where you came from. This is how we do it here. You know, like Joshua was saying, you know, as for me and my house, we will serve Yahweh, you know. Um, a lot of Christians will use that for other means, but I think he's saying, you know, under this tribe, the, the, the tribal league, these are the things that we will say to our children, and these are the things that we choose to pass down. And we will reenact these things within the community um, so you can see. Like, it happens also in uh, Native Americanism. In, in the book uh, Black Elk Speaks, where he goes and he has this vision, he, he brings it back to the tribe and they perform the ritual. And actually, it's a really interesting way to show how ritual is composed through that kinds of means. Like, he brings it back, the community participates in it, and it's the participation that makes it more meaningful. Um, just like, you know, the Eucharist in church, you know, you go in, you eat Jesus, drink his blood, um, you, you feel part of the Last Supper all over again, whatever. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, uh, at a time of total distress and 
and forced assimilation that was happening to the Native American tribes, uh, you know, Black Elk ha has this vision, he comes back, and he says, hey, you know, we're going to perform this. And through metaphor and, and ritual and, and um, symbol, translates that, which is the same thing that's happening here, in, except in Hebrew, translates that into a national cohesive uh, identity, which, which is very important. Yeah. What's, what's curious to me, though, is take the Passover, for example. If we're going to say that the Exodus is all non-historical, it's pure myth, why, I mean, you'd have to imagine some point where the Israelites just found themselves doing all the rituals and customs associated with the Passover for no reason, and then they just invented the this particular part in the Exodus story to explain some thing they found themselves doing. Um, it seems to me like, and I think he alludes to this too, like there probably actually some particular reason why they did these things. Or maybe the invention of the story came first, you know. Maybe the story was invented, they had these myths, and then to commemorate something in the myth, um, they eventually, after the myth had already been formed, so this would go against, actually, Gunkel's idea, because he's saying the ritual and ceremonial and customs came first, and the story was subsequent to explain why they found themselves doing that, which seems weird to me. To me, I would, it seems like it would be easier to say they, they, had, they had a myth, they developed a myth for whatever reason, and then later on they developed a a ritual or a ceremony to commemorate something that happened in that myth. That yeah, Walter Berker uh, had brought up the same topic when talking about Greek mythology and Greek practices. Yeah, yeah. And uh, he he had like a whole section on that, I believe, in his book um, Greek Religion. And going through that, I I I don't know. I'm of the camp that the event is reenacted later. So something happened and then reenacted later. But that event that happened can be in abstract form, but it was some event, you know. Mm -hmm. The the other thing I was going to say is as a possible alternative explanation, say there was some um, like origination event that started this ceremony or ritual, but that somehow it through the generations it, it had gotten lost or forgotten, and at some point they needed to see that. I don't know. I just it just doesn't make sense to me. Wayne brings up a good point. The what Gunkel's explaining here. He says, it seems like, it would be like us creating a new story to explain why we hide Easter eggs. I mean, the story has to precede the ritual, don't you think? Well, the ritual first, uh, because why do the ritual if, if it lost all meaning? That's what I'm saying. Like, you don't do a ritual for no reason. There, you, right. The, the ritual must come about because of a reason. So I, I guess we're agreeing. I don't know, but it seems like maybe maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong. But it seems like Gunkel's arguing the Israelites at some point just found themselves doing these things inexplicably, and so they had to invent some story to explain why they just found themselves doing these things. That's how I'm reading what he's saying, and that to me seems totally now, far. Here, uh, Wayne made a good point. No, we can create new story to explain Easter tradition is the reason. That's correct. And you know how that's done through uh, being assimilated. Yeah, that's a good point. That's kind of where I was going originally. That there, that there was so, some... The whole Easter idea wasn't always Jesus. It was a pagan idea first. And it got reinterpreted, yeah. Oh, yeah. They loved so, it. You know? So maybe that's what this is. Like, like That's where I was going earlier. I was saying maybe there was some separate origination event for these 
rituals and ceremonies, but then they got re the explanation for why they um, were doing them got repurposed for some reason. You know, I guess that's that may be that may be um, what Gunkel's getting at. I'm not sure, but it seems to me he's just arguing for the the example of what Wayne said, creating a, a, an entirely new ex nihilo story to explain why we somehow inexplicably finding our find ourselves hiding Easter eggs, you know? Yeah, maybe that'll be my homework assignment. I'll go back and see what Walter Burkert said about that. <laughs> yeah, I'd love to hear what he says. So anyway, he goes on to say, he gives these examples about, you know, um, um, I already talked about why we limp or do a dance at Penuel, all that stuff. So he goes on to say, primitive times felt that there was some immediate manifestation of the nature of the divinity in these monuments. Wait, let me make sure I didn't jump ahead. Yeah. But at a later time, which no longer regarded the connection as so clear and so self-evident. So again, that would allow for the possibility of some repurposing for some reason. Um, raise the question, why is this particular place and this sacred memorial so especially sacred to us? So he's he's kind of um, yeah. I guess it's just a reiteration of what he's earlier arguing. In this case, oh yeah, holy sites. Why is this holy site holy to us? Um, in all manner, we are constantly hearing of certain definite places such as Bethel, Penuel, Shechem, Beersheba, uh, Laka, Roy, Jeruel, etc and of the trees, wells, and stone monuments of these places. These are the primitive sanctuaries of the tribes and families of Israel. Um, accordingly, the, the legend has to supply an explanation of how it came about that the god and the tribal ancestor met in this particular place. So that these holy events were these holy places were to commemorate some meeting of God and a patriarch or some important event. Um, and then he goes on to say, Abraham happened to be sitting under the tree in the noonday heat, just as the men appeared to him. Um, and for this reason, the tree is sacred. The well in the desert, uh, Lacaroy, became the sanctuary of Ishmael because his mother, in her flight into the desert, met at this well, the God who confronted her. Jacob happened to be passing the night in a certain place and resting his head upon a stone when he saw the heavenly ladder. Therefore, this stone is our sanctuary. Moses chanced to come with his flocks to the holy mountain and the thorn bush. Um, probably every one of the greater sanctuaries of Israel had some similar legend of its origin. Yeah, another good one is uh, where Deborah sits under the palm tree. Um, I think it's in uh, Judges uh, 4, verse 5. She used to sit under the palm tree of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim, and the Israelites would come to her for decisions. Yeah, so maybe, maybe, they, maybe that was a, a holy site for them, you know? And that story was meant to describe why it was holy, but again, I have the same problem as with the ceremonial origin. Like, people wouldn't just visit some site unless they already had a reason to do so. They wouldn't need. But then again, as we already talked about, you guys brought up there could be a repurposing of the the particular reason why this ceremony or this site was um, holy. Um. Yeah, and he, he talks about Genesis is full of these types of stories, but there are few found in the later books. Almost everywhere in Genesis where a certain place is named, and at least wherever God appears at a definite place, it is based on such a legend. In these legends, we have the beginning of the history of religion. Um, anything more about ceremonial or holy site 
meteorological myths. We're almost done with chapter two, by the way. Yeah, Wayne says, repurposing is especially important if the older purpose becomes considered heretical, but people still wish to follow the ritual itself. Yeah, that's a really good point. I mean, uh, hasn't Dr. Price said that it's there's some people, I guess, scholars that think that the ritual of circumcision was kind of a toning down of full-blown child sacrifice that it was meant to. Of course, that I guess you could say that that's in the Bible. I mean, it's meant to be um, a symbolic child sacrifice. I don't know. Anyway, um, geological legends. So this is where the lot, pillar of salt, Lot's wife, pillar of salt, would be a perfect example. He gives some others. Such geological legends undertake to explain the origin of a locality. Whence comes the Dead Sea with its dreadful desert? The region was cursed by God on account of the terrible sin of its inhabitants. Whence comes the pillar of salt yonder with its resemblance to a woman? That is a woman, Lot's wife, turned into a pillar of salt in punishment for attempting to spy out the mystery of God. But whence does it come that the bit of territory about Zoar is an exception to the general desolation? Because Yahweh spared it as a refuge for Lot. So that's where he's fleeing from. Um, is that where he goes to flee from um, Sodom and Gomorrah, right? I think that's right. He goes to Zoar, because the angels tell him you'll be safe there. Correct me if I'm wrong. I think I'm, that's just from what I remember. Anyway, um, so he just has a really short tidbit, basically. A lot of the stories that we find are meant to, to give an explanation for um, geological features or the particular condition or nature of um, localities. Um, and then he talks about mixed legends, and this is basically that these stories don't necessarily only contain a single purpose. Um, they could be explaining multiple things at once. He gives some examples. Um, the legends of, of Bethel explains at once the worship at Bethel and the name of the place. The legends of Beersheba contain remnants of history telling of a tribal treaty established there, and at the same time certain religious features as the explanation of the sanctity of the place, and finally some etymological elements. So in the case of Beersheba, three um, etiological elements in the same story. Um, he says, etymological elements, it may be noted, never appear alone in Genesis, but always in connection with other features. And then he says, this is the very end of the chapter. We're pretty much done. Finally, there are legends which cannot be classified under any of the heads given above. Of such are large portions of the legend of Joseph, also the chief feature of the story of Jacob and Laban. The deceits and tricks cannot be understood from the standpoint of either history or etiology. That's the end of chapter 2. So any overall closing, concluding thoughts on the material we've gone over so far? Yeah, that whole um, what came first, the uh, chicken or the egg uh, theory on ritual or <laughs> event, you know, like uh, I'm going to have to look into that. I, I got Burkert up right now and I'm I was trying to read it, I dug it out and uh, I just need to find out which book he was talking about it in but there was uh, one chapter that I remember going through that 
And right now he's saying that a lot of times, um, you know, ritual was created, you know, for certain uh, aspects of, say, initiation and war and all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. And then maybe stories, stories were uh, elaborated around those. So that that's how I can see. So so if you have an initiation rite that you've always done, you may not know the reason. And then finally, somebody asks you, or you think about it, um, you would have to come up with something because, like you're saying, why would you do it in the first place? Yeah. So you know, I don't think you would get away constantly with just saying, "Oh, this is what we've all, all done." So so I think like. Maybe in the biblical literature, it's just like, hey, you know, when your children ask you this, so they've already developed the first part. They're doing the ritual. You know what I mean? For whatever reason, we don't know. And then it's saying, you know, when your children ask you, you know, it, it's a part of their heritage and nation building and all that, and connectedness to the community, and maybe avian initiation rights into the community, especially with circumcision and all that. Um, you know, this is what you say. You know, this is the this is the legend or story or whatever event connected to that. Because you, you got to tell them something, like you're saying. Like it, people would just not do it after a while if if they felt no connectedness to it. Yeah. And uh, I can't even a moment in time where people would be doing something and have no idea why they're doing it. it seems to me that there must have been some form of an explanation at any given point in the history of that ritual where they had some explanation for doing it. And, and I think, too, that's why uh, Isaiah was, was uh, screaming about because it just came to be part of formality. You know, later, yeah. he's seen it as that. And he's like, hey, wait a minute. We need the reason back. We need the theological reason back. We need the connectiveness back with the other to make this really work. If not, you're just going through a performance, you know? And Christians like using that as a bat to beat the head of Judaism all the time, you know, because but but yet once you get that connective connectiveness to the other back, you know, it, it does function like it should. Yeah. Yeah, I see what you're saying for sure. Um, Wayne says, what Gunkel says about history behind the legends is plausible, but near plausibility is not evidence that a theory is true. I think Gunkel brings up interesting conjectures, but doesn't do well providing evidence for them. A question to ask is, what kinds of actual evidence that could prove his conjectures could we try searching for? Um, if there was such evidence, what would it look like? And then he says... It, Based on what you were saying with ritual and stuff, he says, even regarding the Eucharist, we have a different explanation for it. First, Clement, that what became the reason later. Uh, are, you, are you saying first, Clement gives a different explanation than the Gospels? Yeah, okay. What does he say about it? I'm not familiar. Or what does first Clement say about um, it? I'm not familiar with that. About why... Christians do it. Anyway, well, he's replying. I'm assuming he is. Um, okay, no problem. I can look it up, too. Uh, yeah, the hist the historical the historicity of of some of these. Yeah, I agree. They're just plausibility, but to some extent, like it seems like we're stuck with just plausibilities in general. Since, um, well, John said, you know, a good book to read would be the Bible on Earth, which goes through some of the archaeological evidence or total lack thereof. Um, for some of these stories, if they're to be taken as historical. Um, I could be wrong. Like, like Gunkel definitely does say that he thinks that um, 
some of the stories we have are meant to explain some situation Israel found itself in. But is he assuming that they're historical? I'm not sure. I don't see where he's assuming historicity for certain. I think he's just saying that these are meant to explain some belief the Israelites had, whether or not it was his historically true belief or not. Am I misreading? What do you think, John? Because I remember you were saying you think he assumes too much historicity. Oh, no mic. Okay. Well, I'll read what you said then. Um, John says this. Gunkel and the some weird compound German word, religion, Geschichtelich, Schul, in general, seems to start, which I'm saying, I think that means religion, critic, light -like criticism. I don't know what, Leech, history of religions, okay. Oh my god, someone, ch there we go, women posted something big. I'll finish reading what, oh my god, then he posted it again. Um, yeah, in general, that long German word, in general seems to start with the theory rather than taking into account evidence. Much more is known anthropologically today than in his day, than in Gunkel's day. The theory is religions were divided into stages of progression from simple to complex societies, especially from polytheistic to monotheistic, and from um, exempore to organize, extempore to organize. I'm not familiar with extempore. Something to do with time. This is, in a sense, too influenced by European progressivism. I'm not going to read that there. Wayman, could you just tell us what it is? Oh, Burkett. Okay. Burkett's view on ritual versus story of origin in the in regards to the Greek religions or religion. <clears throat> um so does anyone have any closing thoughts? Any more closing thoughts about what we've read so far? Otherwise I think we can take it off live if no one does we can take it off live and I wanted to do some housekeeping stuff. Oh, sorry I posted all that. That was supposed to go in my word processor. I, I actually hit paste in it. Sorry about that. <laughs> oh, no, no. No biggie. It's fine. Yeah, I'm going to go back and reread some of this and try and find if I can see where Gunkel is assuming or not assuming some historical origin of some of these things rather than just trying to explain some practice or geological feature or um, tribal relationship you know I'm not sure anyway no one has anything else going once going twice okay I'll just close it out then um, so next week, yeah, so next week, um, I guess I'd like to, if you guys don't mind, I'd like to just do Chapter 3. Um, the audio, just to give you a, a rough idea of the length, the audio book version of it from LibriVox, Chapter 3 is divided into three parts, and each part is roughly 38 minutes on average of the three parts. So... Does that seem like too much to you guys? It's a little more than, the, than these two chapters, but not terribly much more. Um, and I think we can, if, we, if, if that's enough, I think, yeah, okay. Then we can finish the book up probably by maybe two more hangouts after the next one. So three more hangouts total, I think we can finish this book up and decide on our next book. Um, 
So anyway, hope you guys enjoyed that, and uh, next week we'll be doing Chapter 3. If anyone sees this in the meantime the, on YouTube or whatever, feel free to join us. And hopefully after the live part goes done, we'll figure out a, a name for this group and then maybe do the beginnings of, of some kind of schedule for reading. But again, the purpose of this group is to do higher critical of all different forms, um, book reading and discussion, and um, also stuff per uh, peripherally related to biblical texts. So anyway, thanks for everyone for coming. It was really fun. I learned a lot. And next week, Sunday at 7, we're going to do it again, Sunday at 7 p.m. Pacific, 9 Central, unless something changes. And if it does, we'll post the change on the Facebook group. So anyway, that's it.